Hey there everybody, Sage here and welcome to another issue of the blog. And uh, in today's video, I'm gonna be talking about a remedy that I have been using for a really long time in my herbal practice, blue vervain. So this plant right here is verbena hastata and this is uh, a plant of great uh, traditional usage in European herbal medicine. It was actually considered one of the most sacred plants to the Druids, and uh, for good reason, because this is a plant with some very special properties, some very unique psycho-spiritual indications that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on in the post here. So, <clears throat> so let's just go through some of the core properties of this plant and how you would translate that into using it medicinally. So, starting things off, talking about the taste of blue vervain. So this is a really bitter plant. Uh, I consider this remedy to be one of the more bitter remedies um, that I've come across. Um, it's quite potent. And um, what we see with that bitter property is that it's so bitter that it actually sends a shiver down the spine. And that's a, a really interesting indication of the general property of bitter plants because that bitter flavor, uh, as I've said in other posts, it brings the vital force down, right? So bitters have a downward bearing action and that translates to a variety of different properties. Oftentimes it's draining fluids, secretions down and out. But what we see with blue vervain is that it's really kind of bringing the energy down, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail on how the bitter taste relates to that. Um, so it's really, really bitter. We might consider it a nauseant bitter. If you take it in large enough doses, it will kind of upset the stomach. Now, it's not toxic in any way. It's just so bitter um, that it can cause a little bit of a gastric upset. Um, and the other taste associated with this plant is acrid. And the acrid flavor is a, a unique flavor um, in its unpleasantness. <laughs> um, so the, the taste of acrid, it's, I always kind of say it's almost like a combination of, of bitter and sour. Um, Matthew Wood describes the acrid taste really well in the sense that it's like bile in the back of the throat. Um, so kind of unpleasant um, to kind of share some other remedies that have the acrid flavor. So like valerian is a very classic acrid plant. Kava Kava has an acridity. Black Cohosh is acrid. Lobelia, in my opinion, is one of the best examples of an acrid plant. I mean, you take Lobelia and it like hits you right in the back of the throat. So that's acrid. And what the acrid flavor um, indicates in a medicinal plant is typically a remedy that has an antispasmodic property. So all those remedies that I just mentioned are all really great antispasmodics and the same is true with blue vervain. So the primary taste being bitter and acrid. And in terms of its organ affinities, we see that translates to a, a strong affinity for the nervous system here. Um, the nervous system as well as the musculoskeletal system. So um, it's having an action there. I tend to consider it more of a gentle nerving sedative. It's not like a super strong hypnotic. It's not going to make you overly sleepy or anything like that, but it does have a very distinct effect on the nervous system, which then translates into the musculoskeletal system. We also see having it, uh, it having um, a good affinity for the uh, female anatomical reproductive system. Um, and really working kind of on the whole, uh, what Matthew Wood calls the febrile system. It's really an operation on, you know, circulation and the flow of blood out to the periphery, um, thereby having an action on fevers. So, um, so those are kind of some of the main, uh, organ system affinities that we tend, that I tend to think of with blue vervain <clears throat> and that translates into its primary action. So as I mentioned, one of the big actions of this plant is as a nervine sedative. So it has a really nice gentle relaxant effect on the nervous system, calming, sedating, nervous tension, uh, anxiety and things like that, but it's not hypnotic. So it's not so strong that it's going to make one overly tired or excessively sleepy throughout the day. 
Um, <clears throat> so the Nervine sedative is really probably one of the main ways that I've used it. Um, and that also translates to it having a spasmolytic property. So it will really nicely relax constriction, tension, spasm in the musculoskeletal system. And that can work on smooth muscles, which are the muscles that surround organs and things like that, or it can work on skeletal muscle. And, you know, the skeletal muscles, like the bulk musculature of the body. And where we see it having a really specific affinity for the um, skeletal muscles is in the neck. So it's really, really specific for uh, neck tension, people that get really, <clears throat> yeah, tight necks. <laughs> um, and so that's uh, or one of the specific antispasmodic areas that it has, but it'll also work in, you know, for gallbladder colic, digestive cramping, <clears throat> very specific for uterine spasm. Um, and uh, as well as it has even been used for um, uh, spasm and tension in the urinary tract, like around a kidney stone or things like that. Um, so we have a, a nervine sedative and antispasmodic as a very strong bitter. It will do what bitters do, and it's going to have an action on the liver, the gallbladder, the digestive system in the way is pretty typical for any plant that has a bitter taste. It will have a bit of a digestive stimulant property. Um, but really the main property of this plant is as, is as a nervine and as well as be, and because of that relaxing effect, right? Because it's calming the nervous system down and because it's relaxing constriction and tens tension in the musculature, um, that leads to it being a really great diaphoretic. And so diaphoretic is, you know, basically the herbal action that we refer to being used for fever. Um, but there's different categories of diaphoretic. Um, the two main ones that I tend to think of are, there are stimulant diaphoretics. These are like hot, spicy, pungent herbs and foods that bring blood flow up to the surface um, to relieve the internal heat of a fever. And then there are the relaxant diaphoretics. And the relaxant diaphoretics are those used to um, relieve fever, but it's it's, Basically, you use stimulant diaphoretics when the person's feverish, but they feel cold. And you tend to use relaxant diaphoretics when the person acutely feels hot um, and they've got tension in the skin. The sweat pores are, are contracted. They're not producing any sweat. They feel hot inside. They're red faced and they've got tension. They're, you know, their back hurts or they got a headache or they're having a hard time sleeping. They're kind of thrashing around, right? They've got that psychological and physical tension coupled with fever. That's when you like to use a relaxant diaphoretic. And the way those tend to work is what they're doing is they're, through their relaxant effect, they're relaxing the pores of the skin. They're relaxing the capillary beds underneath the skin. They're relaxing all the circulation so that the blood can flow up to the surface open up the pores, start a sweat, and thereby relieve the internal heat of a fever. So that's how blue vervain has been used traditionally for a very long time as a really excellent relaxant diaphoretic. And that, I mean, was used for things like malarial fever. Um, it's very specific for fevers that will not break. Like blue vervain is the choice herb to use when any other diaphoretic fails or another diaphoretic is just not, when another diaphoretic is not working, uh, blue vervain is a really excellent choice here. So those are some of the main actions and properties and affinities of this plant. Moving into the energetics, um, this plant, really its primary energetic property is that it's relaxant, right? So we have that, you know, temperature quality and moisture quality, but then we have the action on tone. And so this plant's primary uh, energetic action is as a relaxant. It's also because it's so bitter, it's definitely quite cooling. And um, because of its bitter action too, it uh, does tend to be a drying plant, although some herbalists do say that blue vervain protects the fluids. But, you know, as an herb that's bitter, it's causing secretions that leave the body as a diaphoretic that stimulates sweating over a period of time. That's all fluids net leaving the body, uh, which will ultimately have a drying effect. So I tend to think of it as a drying effect. 
Um, but some herbalists do mention it kind of like preserving fluids or useful for cases for, you know, in the Chinese model, they would say, you know, the yin is not holding down the yang. Um, so it's like heat um, raging out of control because of a lack of fluids to contain it. Um, so I've heard that blue vervain is useful for those types of conditions. I haven't really used it so much in that way. Um, and personally, as I've used it for longer periods of time, I do find that I get a little more dry from it. <clears throat> so that's how we tend to think of the energetics of this plant. It is very, very specific for the Vata constitution, according to the Ayurvedic model of things. And you see like the plant itself, it's like, it's a Vata looking plant, right? It's very tall, very thin, kind of spindly looking, you know, and it's got all these little narrow flower heads, the way it's just, it's just slender and skinny and thin, and it kind of goes up like that. Um, it's a very distinctly Vata looking plant to me. And, um, and we kind of see that in the plant itself. And we see that in the people that it's really very specifically indicated for. And that kind of brings me to the specific indications of this plant. This was one of the original Bach flower essence remedies. Of course, you know, herbalists these days are making flower essences out of like every plant, um, but this was one of the original Bach flower remedies. And it's got some really interesting specific indications from a psychological and emotional perspective. And <clears throat> What we see there is that it's very specific for um, people with mental excess, like people that think too much and people that are really driven. Like the blue vervain person is someone that's really exhausted all the time, but they're still going. Like they're, pu they're constantly pushing themselves. They're constantly, um, they're very driven. They like to get things done. <laughs> uh, Matthew Wood always says that the blue vervain person is an avid list maker. Um, they tend to be really hard on themselves, but they also tend to be really hard on other people because they have a very high ideal. They have a very high standard that they set for themselves and on other people. And that can lead to uh, people not meeting that high standard and then they can kind of like get after them and get hard on them about it on themselves and on other people. And that can then lead to this pattern of nervousness, anxiety, tension, uh, coupled with exhaustion and burnout. So they said the blue vervain person is kind of a very type A personality in a way. And so in kind of coming back to the energetics, it's also very suitable in that way for an excess of pitta. So we're talking about excess vata and excess pitta. So it's like too much wind in the mind, too much nervousness, stress and tension, but then there's a fire underneath of it, right? That's kind of driving it and pushing it forward. And they kind of uh, negatively feedback loop on one another in a way. Um, so that's how I think of this remedy constitutionally from the perspective of the tissue states of the physiomedical, it's very specific for the wind tension tissue state, which is essentially an excess of Vata. Astrologically, that would be an excess of Mercury, uh, an excess of Gemini, um, an excess of kind of those air element qualities. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the specific indications or the unique special potency of this plant and um you know another signature actually is the purple flowers like the pur purple flower plants um oftentimes have nervine properties and so we see that certainly with blue vervain kind of associated with the the top of the head you know the the crown area the brain the mind the um kind of those higher centers in the in the body um, physical and uh, esoteric or spiritual body. Um, and then, um, and then the neck thing is also the very specific indication. So you're right. So the way it relaxes tension in the liver makes it specific for headaches, but headaches that start in the back of the neck. So it's the, the tension in the neck and in the shoulders and then radiating up or around those kinds of tension headaches. It's really specific for, 
And it was also traditionally used for epilepsy, so epileptic seizures that start in the nape of the neck and then work their way down um, was another specific indication for this plant. So there's a lot of things that kind of, it's like where the head attaches to the rest of the body, um, things that start right there is one of the kind of the unique properties of blue vervain and that's usually what I refer to as like the fifth key of understanding a plant holistically is like what is its uniqueness what is its special specialty you know every plant has kind of a unique thing that it does that can't necessarily be classified under tastes and actions and affinities and energetics and so that fifth key is kind of looking at that special potency uh, in ayurveda it's referred to as prabhava or the yeah the special potency or the uniqueness of that herb um, so these are some of the core properties of blue vervain and uh, whitney's going to share a little bit about the um you know, gardening and growing and preparations and things like that. And then I'll pop back in and talk about some of the astrology of this herb. All right. So this is a uh, verbena hastata, which is native to North America. So it'd be found in parts of uh, the United States and Canada. And there is an officinalis, which is native to Europe. So it has a long history of also being used by Europeans. Um, it's in the Verbenaceae family, even though it has a square stem, which most mint family plants have, it's kind of a signature of a mint family plant. It's not in the mint family, but um, as far as growing this herb, I love having it in the garden. It's gorgeous, and it's beautiful, and it's really hardy, so um, it's easy to get started from seed. I had really great germination with this. It loves the cold, so give it a little cold stratification starting at early spring. Um, so the cold kind of helps wake the seeds up and then um, I've also found it sprouting up all over the garden so it will come up and self-seed on its own as well. Um, can also be harvest or grown from root division so in the fall if you were gonna um, cut it back and then you can divide the plant and propagate it that way or from uh, cuttings it's another way that you could propagate it. For harvesting, um, the medicinal parts are the aerial herb and flower. So we would, we would harvest this and um, garble this down. So take the leaves off the stem and then use these beautiful flowers for the medicine. And it's a really, it's a bitter plant. So you're not really gonna wanna use it in a tea. Um, the best extraction is uh, tincture as far as what we usually do is harvest it and tincture it fresh. It can also be, um, picked and dried and then tinctured dry at about like a 50% alcohol or 40% um, and then fresh we'd probably be tincturing it around 60% alcohol um, but yeah it's super easy to grow and it's lovely to have in the garden it's a great medicinal plant to have around it is a bit sensitive to the um, you know, if you dry it you probably want to use it really quickly and wouldn't want to have it uh, get too hot because the medicinal compounds can really degrade in heat and um, lose their potency if it's been sitting around for a while. So we usually just pick it fresh and use it like that. All right, so let's talk about some of the more esoteric dynamics around this plant, some of the planetary and elemental rulerships. So in regards to the elements, I really feel like this is a distinctly air element plant. And we immediately see this in the morphology of this herb. Look how tall and skinny this plant is. I mean, as I was mentioning earlier, it kind of relates to that Vata Dosha in Ayurveda, which is associated with the air and the ether elements. And we see that in, in the morphology, the tall, slender, thin nature, it's moving up. It has this upward movement there, which really shows the way in which this plant is working kind of in the more etheric elements of our being, I guess, right? In the sense of its psychological indications, right? It's really good for mental excess. Like to me, this plant is so specific for those people that are just thinking, 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 and kind of stressing themselves out from thinking so much, and then putting all that pressure on themselves, and like I was mentioning earlier. So that air element is really strong within this plant, and we see that the way it works through the nervous system and the way that it's working in the mind. 
Um, astrologically speaking, I, I place this plant under the planet Venus. And we see that in, um, again, the morphological characteristics are, are Venusian to an extent with the, the delicacy of it, the small dainty flowers and just kind of how slender it is. Um, but really we see Venus in the way that this plant is anti-spasmodic. Um, Venus is, is the great relaxant kind of planet in medical astrology, right? The whole nature of Venus is, has kind of a calm disposition. Um, it tends to be very relaxed. And we see that in the medical influence of that planet in terms of what it does in the tissues. It creates relaxed tissues. Like when Venus is imbalanced, the tissues are overly lax and can be leaking fluids. But conversely, it's specific for when the tissues are overly tense and contracted, it relaxes that. So that's where the antispasmodic property comes in, is very Venusian. And then the way in which the blue vervain person tends to be really kind of like rigid and like they don't flow very well and they tend to be really rigid and they can really project that onto other people so they can really kind of have this box of the way they want to be and the way want, they want other people to be and it really affects their relationships. Venus of course is that planet associated with relationships and so I always like to say blue very vein kind of brings a relaxation into how one relates to others. It's like it allows you to just accept people for who and how they are and not have them need to be a certain way. And so there's kind of that relaxation in terms of the way we perceive and approach and think about other people. Um, I remember Matthew Wood shared a really kind of a humorous case study about a blue vervain person. It was the woman, she was a, she was a teenager and she was having really bad menstrual cramping and was getting, um, like really irrit irritable um, around her menses. And uh, and he was just seeing that she was kind of a blue vervain person. And he was like, oh, do you, do you like to make lists? You know, cause that's kind of one of the specific indications of blue vervain. And she goes, oh yeah, I'll sit down and I'll make lists of every, all of my friends faults, right? Like making lists of all the problems and wrong things about other people. And to me, that's such a clear, the new like kind of um unhealthy venus in that person right is they're not thinking about other people like really in a very healthy positive way and so uh when, when i remember hearing that case i was like oh there it is like that's such a clear venus indication of this plant and then of course it's action on the female anatomical reproductive system as a uterine relaxant and antispasmodic, the way it's very specific for menses. Um, he says it's also very, or Matthew Wood also mentions it as it's his top menopause remedy. Um, so like those changes of life um, is indicated uh, for this plant and really great for, and I forgot to mention this earlier, but it is very specific um, in menopause for hot flashes. This is one of the best hot flash remedies. And one of the ways we can think about, I was talking about it as a diaphoretic earlier, treating fever. What's fever? It's Mars. So Mars is creating this excess heat. A hot flash is like this rush of Mars through the body, irritability, you know, kind of stressed out, you know, he says it's really specific for the menopausal woman where they just like, I just want to kill someone, you know, there's like this intensity um, associated with it. And so it's, I like to think of blue vervain as like this Venusian plant that corrects an excess of Mars. And these two planets are in opposition to one another. You know, in the Zodiac, you've got you know, Taurus is opposite Scorpio. Taurus is ruled by Venus, Scorpio ruled by Mars. Conversely, you have Libra ruled by Venus and Aries ruled by Mars, and these are opposite. So Mars and Venus <clears throat> have these, they balance one another. And so that's the way I think of the medical astrology with this plan is, it is Venus balancing this excess of Mars. And we see that in <clears throat> the blue vervain person too, where they're driven, like these are fiery driven, people that are burning themselves out, right? And that is another really uh, key pattern that we see in people with excess Mars. And this Venusian plant is bringing balance to that. So <clears throat> with that, I hope you learned something good about blue vervain. 
in this post. Thanks so much if you're still with me. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. If you want more uh, content like this, be sure to <clears throat> like and subscribe. Head on over to our blog at evolutionaryherbalism.com. We've got tons more free materials over there for you. And thanks so much for joining me. Until the next one, take care and be well. Thank you.